I'm a modern man, digital and smoke-free, a man for the millennium, a diversified, multicultural, postmodern deconstructionist, politically, anatomically, and ecologically incorrect. I've been uplinked and downloaded. I've been inputted and outsourced. I know the upside of downsizing and the downside of upgrading. I'm a high-tech, low-life, a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, bi-coastal multitasker, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. <laughs> I'm middle wave, but I'm uh, old school, and my inner child is outward bound. I'm a hot-wired, heat-seeking, warm-hearted, cool customer, voice-activated and biodegradable. I interface with my database. My database is in hyperspace, so I'm uh, interactive, I'm hyperactive, and from time to time, I'm radioactive. <laughs> Behind the eight ball, ahead of the curve, riding the wave, dodging the bullet, pushing the envelope. A fully equipped, factory-authorized, hospital-tested, clinically proven, scientifically formulated medical miracle. I've been pre-washed, pre-cooked, pre-heated, pre-screened, pre-approved, pre-packaged, post-dated, freeze-dried, double-wrapped, and vacuum-packed. And I have unlimited broadband capability. <laughs> I'm a rude dude, but I'm the real deal. Lean and mean, cocked, locked, and ready to rock. Rough, tough, and hard to bluff. I take it slow. I go with the flow, I ride with the tide, I've got glide in my stride. Driving and moving, sailing and spinning, jiving and grooving, waving and winning. I don't snooze, so I don't lose. I keep the pedal to the metal and the rubber on the road. I party hardy and lunchtime is crunch time. I'm a true believer. I'm an overachiever, laid back and fashion forward. Up front and down home, low rent, high maintenance. <laughs> I'm supersized, long-lasting, high-definition, fast-acting, oven-ready, and built to last. A hands-on, foot-loose, knee-jerk head case. Prematurely post-traumatic. But I'm feeling, I'm caring, I'm, I'm healing, I'm sharing. A supportive, bond bonding, nurturing, primary caretaker. My output is down, but my income is up. I take a short position on the long bond, and my revenue stream has its own cash flow. I read junk mail, I eat junk food, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash sports. <laughs> I'm gender specific, capital intensive, user friendly, and lactose intolerant. I bought a microwave at a mini mall, bought a minivan at a mega store, I eat fast food in the slow lane. I'm toll free, bite sized, ready to wear, and come in all sizes. I'm on point, on task, on message, and off drugs. I've got no need for coke and speed, I've got no urge to binge and purge. I'm in the moment, on the edge, over the top, and under the radar. A high concept, low profile, medium range, ballistic missionary. A streetwise smart bomb, a top gun bottom feeder. I wear power ties, I tell power lies, I take power naps, I run victory laps. I'm a totally ongoing, bigfoot, slam dunk rainmaker with a proactive approach. A raging workaholic, a working rageaholic, out of rehab and in denial. <laughs> I've got a personal trainer, a personal shopper, a personal assistant, and a personal agenda. You can't shut me up, you can't dumb me down, because I'm tireless, and I'm wireless. I'm an alpha male on beta blockers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hanging in, there ain't no doubt, I'm hanging tough, over and out. <laughs>
red hat that doesn't go at all, and certainly, certainly doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy <laughs> and summer gloves and satin slippers. <laughs> and say we have no money for butter. <laughs> I shall sit down on the pavement when I am tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the railings. <laughs> and that will help make up for the sobriety of my youth. <laughs> I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick flowers from other people's gardens. <laughs> and I shall learn to spit. <laughs> you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go, or only bread and pickles for a week. And you can hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now, now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the streets, <laughs> and set good examples for our children, and we must have friends to dinner, and read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe I ought to practice a little, you know, so my friends who know me won't be so shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and wearing Monday, in Christian countries, the day after the baseball game. 
<laughs> Neighbor, one whom we are commanded to love as ourselves, and who does all he knows how to make us disobedient. <laughs> Ocean, a body of water occupying about two-thirds of a world made for man, who has no guilt. <laughs> Peace. In international affairs, a period of cheating between two periods of fighting. <laughs> Rector, in the Church of England, the third person of the parochial trinity, the curate and the vicar being the other two. <laughs> Ultimatum. In diplomacy, a last demand before resorting to concessions. <laughs> Disaster by Baxter Black. Well, I played in a golf tournament a while back. I got assigned to a group, a quartet, I think they called it. And I rode in the little electric car with a guy named Jerry. He was a very nice enough guy, but he seemed a little forward when he asked me what my handicap was. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything real bad except my addiction to Miracle Whip. <laughs> told that my nose might qualify for a parking spot. <laughs> Jerry asked me how well I played, and I said, I tune it up. He must have thought I was modest, because after the first hole, he turned to me and said, Andy, you sure weren't lying, were you? <laughs> now, this game, you played 18 holes. Why that number, I don't know. You think they would have chosen 10, or a dozen, or even 20. Probably the first golfer just played till his arms got sore and he decided that was enough. <laughs> when you get down to it, there are two weapons that we use for golf, the driver and the putter. You think that uh, they had chosen, uh, first, the first you line yourself up between two swimming pool floats and you tee off. This is done with a driver, which is like a fly rod with a fist on the end of it. <laughs> Only my gun bearer knew the directions to aim. He would stand beside me and point off in the horizon. Then tell me to hit the ball off in that general direction. But it was impossible to predict with any certainty where the ball would actually go. By the end of the first hole, we had traded down our cart for an all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> was riding with an armored personnel carrier. <laughs> They make a nice fellow that lent me his golf bag and a pocket full of balls. I lost six of them in the first two holes. <laughs> I was ashamed of telling that for fear he'd think I'd stolen them. <laughs> I lost so many that eventually we rented a backhoe for the sand traps and I hired two scuba divers to join our caravan on the water. <laughs> Once you make the green, it's recommended that you use a putter. The only comparison I can make to putting is that it's like shooting eight ball on a table where the Navy has been launching jets. <laughs> I think I could drop the ball from a helicopter and have a better chance of hitting the hole. Finally, though, they let me putt with a snow shovel. <laughs> I totally improved my game. Well, I haven't been asked back. Maybe I'll get invited to a bowling tournament next time. At least that way I won't lose so many balls. <laughs> Excuse me, are you the registry consultant? Well, I'm here to register for gifts. This is really a big step for me. I'm very excited. I, I bet you get that a lot, don't you? Uh, oh, when is the happy event? Oh, you mean the wedding date. There isn't one. <laughs> I'm getting married. I just need things. <laughs> and I think registering is a good way for me to learn to receive. <laughs> yes. I know this is the bridal registry and that you only register brides. Frankly, I find that a bit discriminatory. 
I'm here to register, and I really don't want any hassle. No, 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 don't get the manager. I'm really not trying to cause trouble. Look, for months now, I've been buying gifts for all my friends that are getting married. It's an epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> There's slews of weddings, not to mention showers lately, and I've attended all of them, bought gifts for every event. It, it, it's not that I begrudge them their happiness, not at all. It's just that lately, I've been feeling that things are a little out of whack, you know? sort of off balance. And yesterday, well, I was tying little silver bells to the spice rack for my friends Howie and Sandy. This voice inside my head suddenly screamed, enough already! <laughs> <laughs> and I had to agree with it. I mean, isn't it enough that they found each other, that they fell in love and made a commitment? That they'll be splitting the rent and fighting jointly? I mean, they've already won the sweepstakes. Why should they get all the door prizes too? Why do they get to register for things like eggplant shaped cookie jars and really good knives that actually match? They're becoming a two income family. They can buy their own knives! <laughs> I need better towels, matching luggage, a pasta machine. Oh, yes, and those sterling silver candlesticks. Put me down for two pair. Come on, just do it. You registered Howie and Sandy, and I insist on registering too. I know, I'm single. But I'm not staying single without the same material goods as my married friends. My ship is coming in if I have to tow it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and next Saturday, I'm not throwing a shower for myself. <laughs> and you know the best part? I won't have to return anything if it doesn't work out. <laughs> The chewing gum. Here we have a piece of mm -hmm. chewing gum. It is white and sweet. Chew it a while and stick it on the underside of the mental piece. The hired girl will find it there and chew it a while herself and then put it back. In this, one piece of gum will answer for a whole family. When the gum is no good, Put it in the rocking chair for the minister or your sister's bow to sit upon it. <laughs> the contribution plate. This is the contribution plate. It has just been handed around the congregation. What is there upon it? Now count very slowly or you will make a mistake. Four buttons, one nickel, a blue chip, and one spectacle glass? Yes, that is right. What will be done with all these nice things? They will be sent to foreign countries for the good of the poor. How the poor will rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> the statesman. Here is a statesman. He makes speeches about the poor taxpayer and drinks whiskey. His pants are too short for him. He must have stood in a puddle when he was measured. <laughs> he picks his teeth with a fork. If you neglect your education and learn to chew plug tobacco, maybe you will be a statesman sometime. Some statesmen go to Congress and some to jail, but it is the same after all. <laughs> the oyster. Here we have an oyster. It is going to a church fair. When it gets to the fair, it will swim around in a big kettle of warm water. A church lady will stir it with a spoon and sell the warm water for 40 cents a pint. Then the oyster will move on to the next church fair. 
In this way, the Oyster will visit all the church fairs in town and bring a great many dollars into the church treasury. The Oyster goes a long way in a good cause. <laughs> the Delicate Girl. See the Delicate Girl scratching her back against the door. She has been eating buckwheat cakes. Her beau thinks she is delicate, but he has never seen her tackle a plate of hot cakes on a frosty morning. <laughs> cakes had better roost high on a shelf when she is around. If we were the girl, we should wear sandpaper lining in our dress and not be making a hairbrush of the poor door. <laughs> Stewart's letter to Irma Bombeck. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Irma Bombeck's reply. <laughs> Hi, Irma. This is perfectly delightful note is being sent on paper. I made myself tell you what I have been up to. Since it snowed last night, I got up early and made a sled with old barn wood and a glue gun. <laughs> I hand painted it in gold leaf, got out my loom, and made a blanket in peach and moss. <laughs> then to make the sled complete, I made a white horse to pull it from DNA that was just stand sitting around in my crap room. <laughs> By then it was time to start making the placemats and napkins for my 20 breakfast guests. <laughs> I'm serving the old standard well, of course, Martha Stewart breakfast, but I'll let you in on a little secret. I didn't have time to make the tables and chairs this morning, <laughs> so I used the ones I had in hand. <laughs> Before I moved the table into the dining room, I decided to add just a touch of the holidays, so I repainted the room in pink and stenciled gold stars in the sea. <laughs> then, while the homemade bread was rising, I took antique candle molds made the dishes exactly the same shade of pink to use for breakfast. These were made from Hungarian clay, which you can get at almost any Hungarian craft store. <laughs> well, I must run. I need to finish the buttonholes on the dress I'm wearing for breakfast. I'll get out the sled and drive this note to the post office. As soon as the glue dries on the envelope, I'll make it. <laughs> oh, my breakfast guests don't stay too long. I have 40,000 cranberries to string with Bailey's before my speaking engagement at noon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. I <laughs> love uh, Martha Stewart. P.S. <clears throat> when I made the ribbon for this typewriter, I used one eight inch gold gauze soaked in a mixture of white grapes and blackberries, which I grew picked and crushed last week just for fun. <laughs> Dear Martha, I'm writing this on the back of an old shopping list. <laughs> Pay no attention to the coffee and jelly stains. I'm 20 minutes late getting my daughter up for school, packing a lunch with one hand, on the phone with the dog pound with the other. Seems like old Ruff needs bailing out again. <laughs> I thought I'd be more efficient by making extra pancakes and freezing them, like you suggested. This morning, I popped a couple of them in the toaster for the kids' breakfast. The butter and syrup caught fire and <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor Zelda is coming for lunch. I thought I'd do something special. I burnt my arm on the curling iron when I was trying to make those cute curly fries. <laughs> How do they do that? <laughs> Still can't find the scissors to cut out some snowflakes for table decoration. Tried using an old disposable raver, razor and trashed the tablecloth. <laughs> then I tried that cranberry stringing thing. 
the frozen berries mushed up after I defrosted them in the microwave. <laughs> oh, and don't use fruity pebbles as a substitute in that rice crispy snowball run. <laughs> Unless you happen to like a disgusting shade that resembles three day old pea soup. <laughs> Well, gotta get the smoke alarm turned off. <laughs> Last time I had to use a camera. <laughs> Talk to you later. Love, Irma. <laughs> <laughs>
loud as they can all the time we are trying to pray. <laughs> I bet the Lord can't hear a single word we say. <laughs> they sing about plunging sinners in a bloody fountain drawn from, from Emmanuel's veins. We sing about crowning him Lord of all. I think it is much more ladylike to crown the king than to be plunging around in a bloody fountain. <laughs> <laughs> I took the cotton off my forefinger once and stuffed it in my ear. But just once. <laughs> my mother attended to that. You can't go to the altar rail until you are 12. That is God's etiquette. You can't wear perfume until you are 16. That is Leedsville etiquette. <laughs> After you are confirmed, your sponsors in baptism can't be blamed for what you do. <laughs> you are on your own, and if the devil gets you, it is your own fault. He serves you just right. <laughs> Amen, and Lord have mercy. <laughs> take a moment to announce a health advisory issued by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. It begins with the following statement. In the preceding spring and summer, the spontaneous combustion of powder-free latex surgical gloves caused fires in four different states. The advisory states that in each case the fire involved huge quantities of gloves stored in hot warehouses. But we here at the Bureau of Medical Alarm are asking ourselves, what if a single glove, this is sometimes known as the lone glove theory, <laughs> were to burst into flames? And what if this happened while the glove was on the doctor's hand? <laughs> and what if said doctor's hand was at that very moment inside your personal body? <laughs> Well, we can tell you what would happen. The doctor would charge you a whole lot of money. <laughs> sure, the, the underlying philosophy of our entire healthcare system is that the more scary, painful, and dangerous the procedure is, the more it should cost. <laughs> and so you would definitely pay top dollar to have a flaming glove used in your appendectomy. <laughs> Once word of this lucrative procedure got around, doctors would be prescribing it for everything from crossed eyes to athlete's foot. <laughs> In a related announcement, an alert dental surgeon found that a latex glove he was about to use had a small moth embedded in it. That's right, you could end up with a burning rubberized insect inside your body. Imagine the bill you'd get for that. Flaming rubberized moth treatment, FRMT, 58. Recharge fire extinguisher, $24. Having the undisputed best medical treatment story to tell at parties, priceless. <laughs> Safety Compliance and Nautical Regulation Checklist for ARCs. Now, what is her length? 600 feet. Depth? 65. Beam? Oh, 50 or 60. Uh, constructed of? Wood. Uh, what kind? Uh, buoyant, hopefully. <laughs> Passengers? Kate. Uh, sex? Huh? Oh, half male and the rest female. <laughs> Ages? From a hundred years and up. Oh. Going to Florida, are you? <laughs> Doctor's name? 
We have no doctor. Well, you must provide a doctor, uh, also an undertaker. Who's the captain? <laughs> I am. <laughs> you must get a captain. <laughs> now, what's the cargo? Animals. Uh, how many? Oh, let's see. Big ones, 7,000. Big and little together, um, 98,000. Okay, very well. You must have uh, 1,200 keepers. And now, uh, what is your motive power? What is my witch? Your, your motive power. What, uh, what power do you use in driving the ship? None. Well, you must provide either <laughs> sails or steam. Uh, how long do you expect the voyage to last? About 11 or 12 months. It'll take that long for the floodwaters to recede. A flood? <laughs> yes, sir. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. The waters will rise and cover the mountaintops. Ooh. Well, in that case, I'll have to withdraw the option of sails. You'll have to use steam power and condensed water for drinking. But I was going to dip over the side for water. No, 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 no. By then, the sea will have mixed in with the fresh, and it will all be salt. No, you must use steam, and you must condense your water. Now. Here is a list of discrepancies that you'll need to correct before we can authorize this art. <laughs> All this before I can sail? This could take months. No. Work weekends. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I've bloomed in organic gardening and in dance I've tightened my thighs and in consciousness raising there's no one around who can top me and I'm working all day and I'm working all night and to be good looking, healthy and wise and adored and contented and brave and well read and a marvelous hostess and bilingual <laughs> and athletic, artistic. Oh, won't someone please stop me? <laughs> <laughs> about my wife, Yetta, and she rests in peace. We were married for 59 years. We almost made 60. You want to know how we met? Never mind, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting to use the toilet. Yeah, you see, we lived next door to the Gerelics, and there was this one toilet in the hall. And so the Gerelics, there were six of them and one border, and the Greens, there were six of us and no borders. So my father wouldn't have it. All 13 of us shared this one toilet. So, I'm 25 years old. I'm just getting home from work. I run up the stairs because I really, I gotta go. I get to the toilet, and wouldn't you know it? Someone is in there, and someone else is waiting. Someone who's waiting, I never met her before. She's a cousin of the girl that's just come over from Russia. This she, she doesn't know from England. But all I can think about is, I gotta go. I gotta go. And wait a minute. Now, 14 people are gonna share this toilet? So, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm dancing. I'm waiting. I keep talking, and pretty soon I'm thinking, this is a very nice girl here. Well, so then, suddenly, my, my brother Marvin comes out of the toilet. My brother Marvin, you should understand, probably didn't even have to go. <laughs> he just liked to be alone, and in those days, the only place to be alone was the toilet. <laughs> so Yetta says to me in, in Yiddish, this was, you go ahead. I said, no, you were here first. She said, you're dancing faster, you go first. <laughs> and that was it. We were married six months later, 59 years. We never once had an argument. <laughs> Copper clapper caper. <laughs> Help, there's been a robbery. Someone stole my clappers. Your clappers? Yeah, you know those things inside a bell that makes them clang. The clangers? Yeah, that's right. We call them clappers in the business. Hmm, a clapper caper. What kind of clappers were copped in us caper? No, they were copper clappers. And where were they kept? In my closet. Who might have copped the copper clappers from your closet? <laughs> well, I once fired a man who said it. You get even. What was his name? Claude Cooper. <laughs> Why, I bet Claude Cooper caught the copper clappers from my closet. Where was, where's this Claude Cooper from? Cleveland. I think yes. <laughs> and they were my best ones. They were really classy. Classy copper clappers? That's right. Why do you think Cleveland's Claude Cooper were copper classy copper clappers kept in your closet? <laughs> Could, be a, Could be a kleptomaniac. <laughs> Well, well, who first discovered that the copper clappers were cops? My cleaning woman, Clara Clifford. <laughs> and she had just cleaned them last week. That figures. Now let me see if I have the facts straight here. Your cleaner, Clara Clifford, discovered your clean, classy copper clappers kept in a closet were caught by Claude Clooper, the kleptomaniac from Cleveland. Is that about it? Yes, and if I catch that kleptomaniac Claude Cooper from Cleveland who caught my classy copper clappers in my closet, yes, I'll clobber him. <laughs> Sarah, Sim Sarah Sylvia Cynthia Stout would not take the garbage out. Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout. I'm sorry, by Charles Silverstein. Sarah Sylvia Cynthia Stout would not take the garbage out. She scoured the pots and scraped the pans, she candied the yams and spiced the hams, and though her daddy would scream and shout, she simply would not take the garbage out. And so it piled up in the ceiling, coffee grounds, potato peelings, brown bananas, rotten peas, chunks of sour cottage cheese. 
It filled a can, it covered the floor, it cracked the window and blocked the door. <laughs> when the bacon rinds and chicken bones, drippy ends of ice cream cones, prune pits, peach pits, orange peel, gloppy dumps of cold oatmeal, pizza crust and withered greens, soggy beans and tangerines, crusts of black butter, burned butter toast, crispy bits of beefy roast. The garbage rolled on down the hall. It raised the roof and broke the wall. Greasy napkins, cookie crumbs, pops of gooey bubble gum, cellophane from green bologna, rubbery blubbery macaroni, peanut butter caked and dry, curdled milk, crushed the pie, moldy melons, dried up mustard, eggshells mixed with lemon custard, <laughs> cold french fries and rancid meat, yellow lumps of cream of wheat. <laughs> At last the garbage reeds reached so high that it finally touched the sky, and all the neighbors moved away, and none of her friends would come to play. And finally Sarah Cynthia Stout said, okay, okay, I'll take the garbage out. But then of course it was too late. The garbage reached across the state from New York to the Golden Gate. <laughs> there in the garbage that she did hate, poor Sarah met an awful fate. Which cannot right now relate, because the hour is much too late. But children, remember Sarah Stout, and always take the garbage out. <laughs>
Now, all I'm trying to find out is the fellow's name on first base. Who? Who gets the money? He does, every dollar. Sometimes his wife even comes and collects it. Whose wife? <laughs> yes. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Look, all I want to know is when you sign up the first baseman, how does he sign his name? Who? The guy. Ooh, that's how he signs his name. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? No, what's on second base? <laughs> I'm asking you. Who's on second? Who's on first? One piece at a time. Well, don't change the players around I'm on me. I'm not then. changing nobody. <laughs> well, take it easy, buddy. Well, I'm only asking you who's the guy on first base. That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> What's the guy's name on first base? No. What is no? What's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? <laughs> He's on third. You're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? Well, you mentioned his name. I mentioned the third baseman's name. Who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. Who's <laughs> on third? There I go again, on third again. <coughs> Would you just stay on third base and don't get off it? All right, what do you want to know? Now. Who's playing third base? Why don't you insist on putting who on third? What am I putting on third? No, what's on second? You don't want who on second. Who is on first? I don't know. <laughs> third base. <laughs> Look, you got an outfield? Sure. The left fielder's name. Why? I just thought I'd ask. Well, I just told you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who's playing first? Who's playing first? Stay out of the infield. I want to know what's the guy's name in left field. No, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? <laughs> Third, Third base. <laughs> the left fielder's name. Why? Because. Oh, he's center fighter. He's the center fielder. You got a pitcher on this team? Sure. Pitcher's name? Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me today. I'm telling you now. Now go again. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow are you going to tell me who's pitching? Now listen, who is not pitching? I'll break your arm. You say who's on first. I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> um, got a catcher? Certainly. The catcher's name? Today. Today and tomorrow's pitching? Now you got it. All we got is a couple of days on the team. <laughs> you know, I'm a catcher too. So they tell me. I get behind the plate to do some fancy catching. Tomorrow's pitching on my team and a heavy hitter gets up. Now the heavy hitter bumps the ball. When he bumps the ball, me, being a good catcher, I'm going to throw the guy out at first base. So I pick up the ball and I throw it to who? Now that's the first thing you said right. I don't know <laughs> what I'm talking about. That's all you have to do. <sighs> Is to throw the ball to first base? Yes! Now you've got it? Naturally. Uh -oh. Look, if I throw the ball to first base, somebody's got to get it. Now who has it? Naturally. Who? <laughs> naturally. Naturally? Naturally. So I pick up the ball and I throw it to naturally? No, you don't throw the ball, you throw it to who? Naturally. That's better. That's what I said, I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. That's it. That's what I said. <laughs> look, you, uh, you, look, you asked me. I throw the ball to who? Naturally. You ask me. Who you throw the ball to? Who? Naturally. That's it. Oh, same as you. Same as you. I throw the ball to who? Whoever it is drops the ball and the guy runs to second. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it to? I don't know. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. Triple play.
<laughs> Another guy gets up and hits a long fly ball to because why? I don't know. He's on third, and I don't give a darn. What? I said I don't give a darn. Oh, that's our shortstop. <laughs>
be a prisoner in my own house, and you and have you dragging me around on a leash. Not me, Buckaroo. I'm out of here. <laughs> Wait, where will you go? Well, I've always wanted to see Wisconsin. <laughs> Jennifer Jones. I saw it when I was nine. Bernadette was a peasant girl who was visited by the Blessed Virgin Mary in a grotto in Lourdes, France. There, Mary performed a miracle by making a spring of water from a rock. I was riveted. You see, I loved the lady, too. I was a little surprised that the Blessed Virgin wore so much makeup and had red lipstick. <laughs> She was just making an appearance. I felt if I could just suffer enough, I too could become a saint and know the beatific serenity of Jennifer Jones. <laughs> but being from Comac, Long Island, wasn't suffering enough. I prayed that maybe I would develop boils or go mad so that I too could become a saint. <laughs> I set out on my destined course, enlisted my younger sister Mary. We went into my mother's closet in search of robes. Saints always wore robes. And found mother's kimono that father had brought her after World War II. I needed a halo to show my divinity, so we twisted a coat hanger into a circle and put it on my head. With it perched there, we sprayed it white with streaking tip my mother used on her head. <laughs> Next, I had to suffer. All saints suffer. We were to say the rosary three times a day on our knees, but not in the plush carpet of our living room. Oh no, in the gravel driveway. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Our Father who art in heaven, glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Mary left after about a minute to go play kickball. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Our Father who art in heaven, glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. My knees stung. I could feel the other kids looking at me, mocking me. This had to be suffering adequate to me, merit <laughs> sainthood. And then it happened. I felt a presence. I looked up. The lady was there. With the sun directly behind her, it was hard to make out any detail. I squinted. The Blessed Virgin had appeared, wearing a kerchief, a green parka, and smoking a lark. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Lynn, what in the world are you doing? Take off my kimono this instant. And what happened to your hair? Rinse that out and get in the car. We are going to Models. <laughs> Models, the place we bought all our groceries and sometimes our winter coats. <laughs> Hardly a likely sight as a grotto for an appearance of Sainted Mary. But maybe, just maybe. <laughs> <laughs> homegrown tomato. But in August, when the crop from my 30 plants my mama would set out is in full production, tomatoes were no more rare than wonder and wonderful than rocks. One August morning, when I was about 13, mama sent me out to pick tomatoes. My little brother, Spen, and my older sister, Char, were already out there. I picked one and threw it at the crab apple tree. It made a great splat. <laughs> 
<laughs> the tree was full of little apples that we'd have to deal with eventually, and a few of them fell. I was 17 at the time. I heard the sound and gave Sally that look that says, one more of those, I'm going to tell. <laughs> I picked up the biggest tomato I could find and took out a few more apples. Then I chucked one at my brother. Spen whipped one back at me, and we ducked down under the vines, heaving tomatoes at each other. <laughs> because I was doing all the work, <laughs> and because I'm a good person. <laughs> I said over my shoulder, you're going to get it, you're <laughs> going to get it. And then I bent over and went back to work. What a target. <laughs> I picked up a tomato that was so big it had been lying on the ground. It looked as if it had been lying there for a week. <laughs> the underside was brown and it was really juicy. <laughs> I had to cradle it in my hands to keep it from spilling on myself. I stood up took aim, went into my wind-up. I heard my mother from the kitchen window shout Sally's name. Oh no, I had to decide quickly. <laughs> the sound of that rotten big boy tomato hitting the target is a memorable one. <laughs> <laughs> like a fat man doing a belly flop. I let out a holler and I took after Sally faster than she could run. By then I was laughing so hard I didn't even see her coming until it was too late. I caught her right at the foot of the stairs and grabbed her by the shirt collar. I was about to brain her when I heard Mother yell my name. I thought about it for just a minute because I'm a good girl. <laughs> I let her go. And then she burst into tears. <laughs> I guess she knew that the pleasure of obedience is pretty thin compared to the sound of a rotten tomato hitting your big sister's rear end. <laughs>
Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. <laughs> Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. Might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed, and it will end even if we've got to go to sudden death. <laughs> And finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as a field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receiver with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. <laughs> with short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory Balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. <laughs> in baseball, the object is to go home. <laughs> Thank you for your generous donations of food from the food closet, and have a nice evening.